Welcome to a new and exciting episode of Frame Minds Engineering. Today we will discuss the analysis of compression members, and columns fall in this category. This is why we will touch on the uses of columns as compression members, and the difference between columns and beam columns. We are also going to discuss how compression members are used for non-column purposes. We are also going to explain the assumptions and idealizations involved with column theory. I'm also going to show how we can make sense of the Euler buckling by deriving it from the Euler Bernoulli beam theory and visualizing it graphically. We will find out how an eccentric axial load differs from a non-eccentric axial load. In cases where we have such frames, we can break down the problem like this. This allows us to analyze the simply supported beam, evaluate the reaction forces which will then be applied at the columns as axial loads. We can see that the columns have different support conditions and this affects the way these columns will fail. The following table shows the different ideal support conditions and how they affect the way a column buckles. In this case, the column only has axial loads and no lateral loads or bending moments. However, in many cases, this does not apply. When there is a bending moment in the column induced by forces other than the compressive forces, this is called the beam column. Beam columns are mostly parts of moment frames. From the deflected shape, as well as the governing differential equation of an Euler-Bernoulli beam, which I discussed in a previous video mentioned in the description down below, we can see the curvature of the member is directly correlated with the induced bending moment. X is a dimension in the running length of the beam, and Y is the vertical displacement at distance X from the left support, and thus is a function of X. This is why the second derivative of Y with respect to X is the curvature of the member. How much the member bends depends on the elastic modulus, as well as the shape of the section represented with the moment of inertia about the bending axis. Compression members are also used in trusses where the loads inside the members are assumed to be purely axial, which means either compressive or tensile, because the member ends are hinged. Another use of compressive members are bracing systems that are used to resist lateral forces in frames, flooring and roofing systems or other structures as well. We assume that the compressive load in the columns is applied on the centroid of the section. The centroid of any homogeneous isotropic section can be found by equally splitting the left and right areas of the section with a vertical line, and the top and the bottom areas with a horizontal line. The intersection of those lines is the centroid. This is however a very daring assumption because it is impossible that the load is not ever so slightly shifted from the centroid and this has large effects on the column behavior which we will show later in this video. From the previous video about beam analysis, we know that Euler-Bernoulli beams have a single degree of freedom, which is the vertical displacement y. So how can the beam have stiffness in the direction perpendicular to the degree of freedom? It is not exactly intuitive. So let's dive into the mathematics and physics of how this is possible. Let us first make a cut in the beam at a distance x from the pin support. So we can immediately determine that there are no shear forces inside of the beam due to lack of vertical forces, but in the existence of a deflection, there will be an internal moment equivalent to the axial load P multiplied by the displacement Y. Because Y changes along x and is a function of x, this means that the bending moment is also a function of x. The governing equation of an Euler-Bernoulli beam is the following, which physically means that the bending stiffness EI multiplied by the curvature inside of the beam at X is equal to the bending moment at X. To make things easier and neater, we will call the second derivative of Y with respect to X as Y double primed and Y of X as just Y, but always remember that Y is a function of X. By substituting the bending moment in terms of the axial load P determined from the equilibrium equations, we get the following. This can be arranged as follows. 
So this is a second order linear ordinary homogeneous differential equation. It is second order because the highest derivative is a second derivative. Ordinary because all derivatives are with respect to one independent variable x. Linear because all the terms with y have a power of 1 multiplied by constants. And homogeneous because the right hand side is equal to 0. The solution for such differential equation looks as follows. From this, we can determine the constants a, b, and c as follows. And because ei is a positive constant, and b is also a positive constant, b squared minus 4ac is less than 0. And whenever this is the case, the constants alpha and beta will have the following values. When plugging these values in the solution, we obtain the general solution of an Euler-Bernoulli beam under compressive load. Now let us apply the boundary conditions for the specific case of a simply supported beam. We know that there is no vertical displacement at the supports, so y at x equals to 0 is 0. By substituting x with 0, we see that the sine term disappears and the cosine of 0 is 1, so c1 is equals to 0. This leaves us with the second term only to meet the second boundary condition. We can see that if c2 is not 0, there is an obvious but trivial solution which is that p is equals to 0. A second less obvious solution is when the term inside the sign is 0 or is a positive integer multiplied by pi, then the sign is 0 which will meet the boundary condition. So this means that the actual load value required to achieve equilibrium in a simply supported Euler-Bernoulli beam is the following and C2 actually can't be determined in this case and is irrelevant. Let us have a look together how this would look like and try to make sense out of it. Here in yellow we can see the deflected shape of the beam and in black the original state of the beam. We can also see that P critical is the load required to achieve equilibrium for this specific deflected shape of the beam. Let's investigate how the deflected shape changes when changing specific parameters of the beam. When the length of the beam increases, the critical load decreases. However, if the bending resistance EI increases, then P critical will also increase. N, however, have a very interesting meaning. We can see that if N is equal to 2, the shape of the deflected beam is different. But this physically means that the beam is prevented from deflecting in the middle by laterally supporting it. And the higher the number N is, the more frequent the lateral supports will be throughout the beam at exactly the points where the deflected shape meets the beam. It can also be seen that when n increases, the critical load also increases dramatically. An eccentrically axially loaded beam can also be represented by a beam with a non-eccentric axial loading and an applied external moment. This moment is equivalent to the eccentricity E multiplied by the axial load P. Now by taking a cut again through the beam and equating the moments, we obtain the bending moment as follows. Substituting the moment into the governing differential equation will yield the following ordinary differential equation which is non-homogeneous because the right hand side is not equal to zero. This means that we have in addition to the general solution we have a particular solution as well. Because the non-homogeneous term is a constant we can guess a constant particular solution C3. Because the derivative of a constant is zero the second derivative part vanishes and we obtain the value of C3 as negative E. This means that the particular solution is now negative E as well. By enforcing the boundary conditions of the vertical displacements at the end of the beam, we obtain the values for both constants as follows. Notice that here we obtained a fully defined solution. The mathematical reason is that this is a non-homogeneous problem. The physical meaning is that there is a deflection in the beam due to the applied external moment and the configuration is already known. Previously, the question was, what will the deformed geometry be in combination with a certain load P that will achieve equilibrium? 
Now it is more of how does the axial load modify the deflected shape. Let's see what happens when the value of the applied load P approaches the critical load obtained from an actually loaded beam without eccentricity. We can have a look at this term. The EI term would cancel. The square term vanishes from the square root and the lengths cancel. Sine of pi is zero and thus we know that the term approaches zero. When the term approaches zero, the displacement approaches infinity. Let's have a look at that graphically. Let's see what happens whenever we increase the load P. We can see that the deflection is getting larger and larger. What about if the eccentricity of the load increases? We can see that the deflection becomes significantly larger. The same would happen if we increase the length of the beam. But whenever the bending resistance EI increases, then the deflection would decrease. And as the load B approaches the critical load, the deflection approaches infinity. Notice in this case that there is always an equilibrium configuration and P simply decides how large the deflection would be. Don't forget to like and subscribe and turn on the notification bell. Thank you for watching.